Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Today, we're going to talk about a system of the body that you normally don't even think about until it stops working well. Uh, today, we're going to be speaking with Dr. Judy Morgan. She's a world-renowned uh, integrative and holistic veterinarian who has since retired and is also a best-selling author of four amazing books, and she's going to help us learn all things immune system. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation. No pressure. <laughs> So let's Never talk have. about um, a dog's immune system. What does it do? <laughs> uh, well, if you have a good one <laughs> for any species, if you have a good immune system, it keeps you from getting sick. And if you have an immune system that is overworked, overstressed, or not working correctly, everything can go wrong. <laughs> so a good immune system is a really good thing to have. <laughs> and it's really important. And a lot of people, I think, don't even pay attention to it. I, I know for ourselves as humans, and especially with our pets, it's really the last thing we think about with our pets. So um, but it we is think about thing. it when it's not working, when, exactly. when things go wrong. <laughs> exactly. And it's like, oh, crap. <laughs> so hopefully what we're going to do today is teach people about the different parts of the immune system and really get them thinking proactively so that they can make certain their dogs have or cats have the safest and uh, strongest immune system possible. So is there a way that you can actually measure a dog's immune, uh, their immune health? No, <laughs> not a really accurate way. We, we do some tests that we think are telling us um, some answers, but there are some parts of the immune system that are just really impossible to measure. And we don't have all the answers. We don't, we don't, know everything um you know for just as a a quick example when we give vaccines a lot of times we'll run titers which is a blood test and it says oh they have antibodies against distemper and you go oh good he's he's above this arbitrary number that we set that means he's protected that's awesome well okay the numbers are a little bit arbitrary and we have dogs that have zero on those tests and then you challenge them with distemper virus and they don't get sick we have other dogs that have a high number on that test and you challenge them and they get sick. So it's kind of the same with people. So for instance, I had a technician and I, we were working emergency service about two o'clock in the morning and this kitten came in and I did the full exam on the kitten. The kitten lived outside in an apartment complex and somebody was nice enough to rescue this poor little sick kitten and bring it in at two o'clock in the morning and said, well, we don't really know what's wrong with it, but it doesn't seem to be eating well. And it's just been acting kind of lethargic. And so I do my full exam, like oral exam, the whole exam on this cat. And um, when I'm done, like literally hands off, backed away, the little kitten who was sitting on the table, seeming fine, literally turned into Cujo, leaped off the walls and started attacking everyone and bit all of us multiple times, like seven or eight bite wounds each. It was rabid, and I don't even know that I ever would have even thought of it, but my te technician just kind of went, wow, maybe we should check this cat for rabies, and I went, oh, crap, and yes, it was rabid. Now, when, so of course, we had to go get treatment, and I had had a rabies vaccine like 10 years before that, and I had an experimental rhesus monkey vaccine in vet school, because, you know, when you're the vet students, you are experimented on. And uh, so I had never had a titer done. I had no idea if I had protection. They ran a titer and then started me on the prophylaxis and my titer was great. And I got my five shots in the prophylaxis. My technician had been vaccinated as well. And when they went to give her the prophylaxis, she had an anaphylactic reaction. And we can talk about that later if you want, but basically she almost died from getting the injection. So she still had to go through the entire series of either five or seven vaccines. I forget what it was we had to get. And um, so every time they had to give her one, she had to be hospitalized on IV fluids, epinephrine, steroids to get through the treatment. She didn't get rabies, which was a good thing. And at the end of all of that, her titer was zero, wow. zero. So she did not mount an immune response, supposedly, according to the, the blood work after all of those treatments, yet she didn't get rabies. So clearly something worked. So do we have an accurate way to measure the immune system? 
<laughs> don't know. <laughs> and from, I mean, from the example you just gave, it just further supports the fact that we're all individuals, right? And yeah. you really can't generalize across the board. And when we're talking about our pets, what's good for one dog may not be good for another dog and et cetera, exactly. et cetera. Um, exactly. So immunodeficiency versus autoimmune disease. It's something that, I mean, we don't hear, of, I don't hear about a lot of dogs that have autoimmune diseases, but there are. There's a lot. There are many, many out there. Um, and so can you just describe the difference between like an immunodeficiency and an autoimmune disease? Because I don't feel like many people understand it's a wildly uh, different ends of the spectrum. Yeah, it's actually opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah. So immune deficiency is actually something that we don't like a true inborn immune deficiency, like being born, not able to produce immune globulins, IgA, IgG, IgM. Uh, and it never dawned on me um, that that was even a thing because it's not something we see very often. Um, but I had a couple of young dogs and cats that just seemed to be sick all the time. They weren't thriving. They had GI issues. And so I started testing and it's, it's hard to even find labs that will do that will test immune globulin levels. And all of a sudden I was finding animals that had immune deficiency, like zero ability. So here we are, we've got these puppies and kittens, we're poking them with all these vaccines. And then I'm discovering that, hey, these guys don't even have the the building blocks of an immune system, so they can't respond to anything. And they're sick all the time, they have GI problems. Um, the good news is a lot of them will kind of, out, if you can keep them alive until they're a year old, then they kind of settle in and they're able to survive. Um, so that's a true immune deficiency. It's not that common, but I did see quite a few in practice. Uh, the opposite end of the spectrum is autoimmune disease. And that's where the immune system thinks, so the immune system is supposed to attack foreign invaders in the body. So, you know, your, your neighbor's puppy has parvovirus and it comes over and it poops its bloody diarrhea and vomits on your lawn. And then your dog goes out there and walks through it and licks his paws and gets this huge load of parvovirus into his system. Well, if his immune system works, which are the white blood cells, the immune globulins, um, all the red blood cells, all the things in the body that are supposed to, that's the innate immune system that's supposed to work, it'll neutralize that virus and it'll it'll say, hey, you're not allowed in here, we're, you know, we're kicking you out and it'll get rid of it if we have a good immune system. Um, but sometimes, the body goes a little haywire and the immune system starts attacking everything. Um, we see this a lot with um, synthetic things that are put into the body. So synthetic vitamins and minerals, for instance, which is why I'm such a huge fan of feeding whole foods and getting our nutrition from whole food supplements, not from synthetics. Um, but anytime we put something foreign into the body, the immune system has to react to it. Well, sometimes the immune system is like trying to attack so many things and it gets oversensitized. And so not only is it attacking those foreign invaders, but it may start attacking the body itself. So it could attack kidney cells, skin cells, red blood cells, white blood or uh, platelets, um, even and, white and blood cells. And it's cells. attacking healthy cells. It's not right. attacking sick cells. It's the healthy right. cells. Right. So cells, right? it can attack. So an autoimmune disease is when your immune system attacks your normal healthy cells in the body. Um, so we get things like lupus, uh, pemphigus, um, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, autoimmune thrombocytopenia, autoimmune uh, polyarthropathy, which is attacking the joints. joints. Yep. So there's a lot of different autoimmune diseases that we can see. And so uh, it's not, so what we do with those is, you know, we want to jump in and suppress the immune system. And if you're a traditional veterinarian, you want to throw about 16 different Im immunosuppressants <laughs> at the animal and try to wipe everything out. And, you know, sometimes you have to attack pretty heavily at the beginning just to get over the hump and keep them alive. Uh, but then it's really not about suppressing the immune system. It's about calming it and evening it out and retraining it to react appropriately. Um, so, you know, it's kind of the, your, your spouse gets home late from work and you can go, oh, gee, 
did you, you know, did you hit traffic? Was there a problem? Or you can be that screaming maniac as soon as they walk in the door and just start yelling at them. Um, so that's the immune system just like yelling at everybody because it's mad um, instead of just going, hmm, something's not quite right here. <laughs> so now just for the clarity of um, our viewers, let's talk about allergies, right? Because allergies are much different than autoimmune disease, much different than immune deficiency. Um, what causes allergies? What type of immune response is that? So there's actually four different levels of allergic reaction, and it's a lot to get into. But um, so the worst one is the anaphylactic reaction where your body says, holy crap, and, you know, everything swells up. You can't breathe. You're vomiting. You've got diarrhea. You're passing out. Your blood pressure drops. You're in shock. Um, that's the worst one. But what we tend to see is, you know, milder allergic reactions. And I know for those people who are dealing with animals that are scratching their skin off and they're a bloody pulp, they don't think that's mild. But compared to anaphylaxis, it's mild. Um, so allergies happen from repeated exposure to something. So when I get people who say, oh, my eight week old puppy has allergies, they really can't. Like they, they, they haven't been exposed yet. Like they can't. So for kind of the true allergies, we don't see those until the animals are over a year of age because let's say it's a seasonal allergy to a certain pollen. Well, they have to have been exposed to it the first year and their body got sensitized to it. Like their immune system said, oh God, I don't like all that pollen from those pine trees. That's kind of obnoxious. Um, so the first year, you know, the body will react in a normal way, which is, you know, the eyes might run a little bit, the nose might run, they might sneeze more because that's when you get the watery eyes and the runny nose, that's the body trying to wash that stuff out of the system. So you cough maybe because you, you're inhaling that stuff. For our dogs, it tends to uh, cause the itchy skin. Um, so, but then the, every year it'll get a little worse and a little worse because the immune system got sensitized to it. And now, so like dogs with flea bite allergy, they get fleas as a puppy and like they do the normal flea itching. And then if they become sensitized to the flea saliva, the next year, the first bite they get, they may, I have one of these, one bite, man, he's gonna rip himself open. Um, so that's just the immune system getting sensitized and hyper and being overstimulated. Yeah, yeah, being overstimulated. Over, yeah, so it, get, it becomes overreactive. It's not necessarily, and it's not at all, uh, because of a weak immune system. It's, it's actually mm -mm. the opposite. It's actually an over, an overly exuberant immune system. Exactly. It's like, ah, you know, in, in, again, instead of quietly asking why all that pollen is in the body, the body goes, oh my God, what are you doing here? I have to get rid of you and goes nuts. So <laughs> I, I want to get into uh, the different parts of the immune system, the innate immune system and the adaptive. But before we do, um, I know what I think causes the dog's immune system to weaken as far as like environmental factors and whatnot. And there are a lot of obviously, you know, internal by vaccines over vaccination, but can you talk to different causes from a medical standpoint that weaken the immune system and expose our animals? Well, I mean, we do a lot of things wrong for one thing. Um, so, and it's interesting because I was just talking about this to somebody else the other day, but uh, we need to start off with a healthy microbiome. And the microbiome, we, we talk about the gut all the time, but it's not just the gut. We have a microbiome on our skin. We have a microbiome in our respiratory tract. We have a microbiome from our mouth all the way down to the other end of the digestive tract. Um, so the microbiome is everywhere. Interestingly, now that you know we get, we have certain breeds that kind of have a hard time being born other than by C-section, so when you're when you're born, you don't have a microbiome. Everything's sterile inside the womb. On the way out, passing through the reproductive tract to get to the outside of mom, you pass through mom's reproductive tract where there's a microbiome, and that's your first exposure to a microbiome. Well, guess what breeds have a lot more immune problems, allergy problems? Those who are being born by C-section. Hmm. They miss out on the microbiome from the first minute of life. So they're not getting inoculated. Their immune system is not getting inoculated with exposure 
to what it needs and it's not getting exposure to the good guys, the, you know, the good bacteria, the good viruses, the good fungi that we need in our body to fight off things. Um, so that's part of the problem. If you have an animal who's born by C-section, there is a somewhat genetic component. There was a great study out of Finland a couple years ago where they looked at dogs who the parents had allergies and then they looked at uh, if the puppies had allergies and if both parents had allergies, the chances of the puppies having allergies are like, <laughs> good luck. Uh, if one parent had it, it was still really high. Um, and it actually had to do also with the diet the animals were fed. So the if the mom was kibble fed and the puppies were weaned on to kibble and there was allergies in the family history, the chances of the allergies being worse in the young dogs as they grew were much higher. If the mom uh, was raw fed and the puppies were immediately started on raw fed, the chances were much lower. So we, you know, and I can only look at that and think, well, okay, what's the difference between a kibble fed dog and a raw fed dog is, well, the kibble fed dog has a lot of synthetic vitamins and minerals added in. So remember I said, synthetics are foreign invaders. The body doesn't recognize them as something natural to the body. So that's part of what they're reacting to. But when we have a high heat processed food, we also have endotoxins from the bacteria that are killed in that heat processing. We have aflatoxins from the molds that are in the, the grains that are in there or the legumes that are in there. So there's so many, so it makes, to me, it makes perfect sense. And it was a great study that showed, you know, the allergies can be related to what the mom ate or what the mom's mom ate and also how the puppy is delivered into the world. So that's a couple of factors. Then we start really messing with things and we start vaccinating way too early. We give multiple vaccines at the same time. Um, so most people think I'm going in and I'm getting this one shot for my puppy. That one shot might have 13 different things in it. So it may have distemper, parvo, four different leptos, parainfluenza, um, you, you may be getting, you know, influen two influenzas at the same time. You might get a Lyme at the same time. You know, you might get the rabies on there as well. So, and then there's Bordetella, which usually contains three or four organisms. So by the time you add all that together, you know, I just, I just feel like that would be like walking into a party and having 15 people go, Whoop! <laughs> and they all want an answer at the same time. And my response will be like, holy crap, I don't even know where to start. So like there's, you know, there's so many things that we do wrong, um, you know, and then we have environmental toxins that the body reacts to. We have, um, you know, the chemicals that we're putting on and in, in our pets, uh, you know, chemical shampoos, um, chemical treatments. I mean, we're, there's, and then we keep screwing up the microbiome by overusing antibiotics and using things, you know, dewormers and things that are killing the, the, the gut microbiome. I mean, and I'm not saying that we never use the, you know, never want to use those things. I'm just saying we need to look at this from a whole different lens. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, we really are setting our animals up to fail. And oh, it's yeah. surprising at the longevity of life that they do have with all that we do. <laughs> So wrong if you really think about it, you know. Um, exactly. <laughs> well, and on the other side of that, I will say, you know, having a holistic practice for a long time, I did have clients who did everything right as far as diet and no vaccines and, you know, good um, emotional support, blah, blah, blah. And then their animal still comes up with a cancer or something really wonky. So, um, you know, whether genetics plays a role in that or what the issue is, you can still do everything right and still have an outcome that, you know, kind of is a little shocking, but, um, certainly you have a better chance of having health and longevity if you are not trying to wreck their immune system every day. I, I am fortunately um, am one of those people that I did everything right. There were no vaccines. There were no flea and ticks. There were, well, they, you know, puppy vaccines, but everything was tighter. We had the blood tested. He ate raw food. He got his exercise. He had a no stress environment. He had play dates. We did everything right. And um, unfortunately, you know, even with all the supplements that you know, antioxidants and medicinal mushrooms and the turmeric and everything to try to scramble those channels so that cancer didn't take part, it did set in. Um, 
So you can really only do the best that you can, but exactly knowledge is what's really important because you at least set them up. You know, I feel that my boy definitely lived a longer period of time because of his lifestyle and how he ate than if we had fed him differently. So yeah, a gift of extra absolutely. Time. Um, and he had the gift of an amazingly happy life where he felt great throughout. And then when it ended, it went downhill real fast. So that's all we can ask, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, sorry. So I always have to talk about Diego in some way, shape or form. That was my boy. Um, so the two parts of the system, we have the innate and we have the adaptive and obviously the innate is like the first line of defense. Um, and then you, right. have the so that's your white blood cells, your platelets, the immune globulins, globulins, the proteins that your body makes to help fight off disease. Um, so, you know, that's, and your microbiome, that's part of that. That's, that's what you get from living in the world and playing in the soil. And, you know, it's, it's what you're born Hold with. On, stop that thought right there. Playing <laughs> in the soil. Can we please talk about this? Everyone that gets a puppy, they're told don't let them be exposed to things. Please tell the truth. What should we be doing with our puppies? Uh, well, let's see. Mine gets to eat chicken poop, goat poop, donkey poop, horse poop, other dogs poop, cat poop, uh, dirt, grass, you know, my potted plants, they're in the garden. Um, you know, as a child, looking back at the time, I was really angry at my sister, but looking back on it, it's like, wow, probably the best thing she ever could have done. But we used to play outside and we would uh, play, you know, kitchen and she would take a stick and, you know, dip it in the mud and tell me it was like my, you know, dinner and I would eat the dirt off the stick. And uh, looking back on it, it's like, hmm, got inoculated with some pretty good stuff, probably. Soil based, <laughs> soil based, uh, my, my soil best, probiotics. Right? <laughs> um, but, you know, there's great studies in children who are raised with animals um, and play outside a lot and are in the dirt. And, you know, maybe mom doesn't make them wash their hands all that. Like my kids, they grew up in a barn. They grew up with a crap ton of animals. Um, you know, we'd, we'd be at a horse show. They'd be dirty. They'd be mucky. And they'd eat their hot dog, you know, with those hands that were just grooming the horse and cleaning its butt. So, you know, they're inoculated with some good stuff. But then we, we look at people who live in, you know, the pristine home where you are literally using antibacterial scrub on every surface and your kids aren't allowed to touch anything and they're not inoculated with anything. And guess who ends up with a weaker immune system? Yeah, I would imagine. And the dogs that you saw that maybe came from a city, right, that didn't get their paws on the ground and the grass that were just kind of in that concrete sidewalk probably yeah. were more You sick. know, it kind of depends because you'd be amazed the crap that's on the concrete sidewalks well, if your true. dog's walking barefoot. <laughs> that's true. That's, that's true. why um, the woman who developed walkie paws, she lives in New York City and she has a little white dog and she's like, I don't want that dog walking through the street with its white paws and then getting in my bed. <laughs> very, very valid point. Very valid point. Um, I mean, I'm sorry to get off on a tangent. So we were talking about uh, the... <laughs> <laughs> the innate system. How about the adaptive immune system? So the adapt the adaptive system is acquired. So when we give a vaccine, we are giving an exposure to parvovirus. Um, we give a killed virus by injection. And so that's the, the, hey, immune system, look over here, come attack this guy. And so then the body makes antibodies against that thing that was injected or um, the exposure. So that's acquired. Um, and that's that really is mostly the antibodies in the body. And that's what we're trying to measure with our titers. But um, there are parts of the immune system that we really can't get to to measure. So there's a, something called a humoral response, which is the cellular response. And we can't measure that. Like we can't pull out a bunch of cells and go, hey, look inside and, you know, what do you got in there? Um, so there's parts that we can't measure. And so when we get these animals that have no titer, what we end up saying is, oh, well, you know, in order to get into daycare, boarding, grooming, whatever, we have to show that they have protection. Well, that's the only way that we know to measure right now. So we end up giving them a booster vaccine. And some of these animals will never, ever, ever develop a measurable titer, kind of like my technician. She was clearly protected, 
Um, but some of them will never develop a titer. And what happens is they just keep getting poked and poked and poked with the vaccine year after year after year. And they just don't mount a response that we can measure. It doesn't mean that there's no response there. We just can't measure it. So when we are trying to be proactive in making our pet's immune system as strong as possible, um, really we're talking about specifically the gut microbiome, right? That's, that's, that's really a lot the, of it. That's where 70%, well, there's a, there's a few stats between 70 to 80% now is where it's moving along that, um, that axis there. But that's where most of what we can do for our animals um, is by dealing with that, as well as more natural food, staying away from synthetic vitamins, keeping them in a stress V zone. Um, the gut microbiome, innate immune access, I know is being studied really intensely right now. Um, can you explain to our viewers what, what that access is? What's the connection? Yeah, well, like a little bit more deeply than what we've just talked about. So the, the microbiome, it's interesting. I just had to, uh, do a prepared talk on this. Um, so the Perfect. microbiome <laughs> is, um, it's crucial and it literally has trillions of organisms in it. Um, and like I said, it's not just in the gut, it's other places in the body. So if our microbiome in our respiratory tract got really out of whack, we would be more prone to respiratory illnesses. Um, the the dogs and, and cats that have really bad mouths, um, tons of tartar, like my dog that's in heart failure, kidney failure, and has protein losing enteropathy has a horrible mouth, even though he had a dental um, within a month or two, horrible mouth again. And it's because his microbiome in his mouth is totally screwed up from all the meds that he's on and all the other things going on with his body. So he has a microbiome that it doesn't matter how many probiotics I throw at it, I can't correct it because he's got all these issues and medications that he has to be on to stay alive. Um, so the, the microbiome can get out of whack for a lot of different reasons. Diet is one of the main reasons. So we need to feed a species appropriate diet that will give the microbiome that is specific and appropriate for that species. So a cat has a different microbiome from a dog, which is different from an herbivore, which is different from an omnivore. So the we have to feed the right diet to get the mi right microbiome. The microbiome, um, we talk about probiotics all the time, but the microbiome is not just bacteria. It is also viruses. It is also fungi. It's also some par some parasites. Um, <clears throat> so that's why when we do things like give a dewormer or give an antibiotic or an antiviral or an antifungal, we don't knock off just the, we're like, oh, we got a staph infection. I'm going to give them an antibiotic or kill all the staff. Yeah, you killed all the staff and everybody and his boyfriend too. So, you know, it's, um, you, you wreck everything when you do that. And then it takes the body time to repair. And so when we get dysbiosis, which can be from stress, it can be from environmental factors, it can be from diet, it can be from medications that are given, it, like we can screw it up so many ways. <laughs> and so then we have to try to reset it and bring it back to where it needs to be. And the ways to reset it are we got to feed the good guys, the good army that we want down there. So we feed them with the prebiotics, which is really the fibers. That's what they, that's what they live on. So we have the prebiotics. Then we add probiotics, which are really bacteria, but we can also like Saccharomyces boulardii. We, we don't talk about that one enough, but that's a, a yeast or fungal organism that sometimes we have to replace that in order to get that population getting back in the right direction. Um, sometimes the pH is completely wrong in the gut because we've got the wrong bacteria growing in there. And then, you know, if things are just really going awry sometimes we're down to okay we've done all that it's not working we need a complete fecal transplant it's like we need to like get rid of all these bad guys let's throw a good army in there and help them rebuild their forces and get things back to normal so that's where like when we test the gut microbiome and we should see i don't know what the numbers are but we should see 20 subspecies of the bacteria and that's done through dna sequencing so we want to see 20 species of bacteria and then we get these samples back and it's like oh he has three 
<laughs> Where'd everybody else go? And, and yeah, <laughs> a non-diversified gut microbiome and the levels are really high on those three. Right. <laughs> so, and you know, we've got great studies now that are showing like the gut brain axis. So those, the, the, the microbiome does a lot it decreases inflammation in the bowel when you have enough good guys because they're making short chain fatty acids those short chain fatty acids form a mucosal barrier so in lining our airways we have a nice little mucosal barrier lining our gut we have a mucosal barrier and when we don't have the food the correct food to feed those good guys and then we don't have enough of those good guys we lose the short chain fatty acid production we lose the the mucosal barrier that's when we get the leaky gut because we have inflamed cells and they spread apart instead of having these real tight junctions they do this and things start to get absorbed into the bloodstream um, that normally would not be able to get there so you know this is how we start developing some of those food intolerances it's like oh well the dog ate chicken and the chicken broke down into these protein particles that were small enough to get absorbed through that leaky gut into the bloodstream and the then the immune system goes whoa that's not supposed to be here like that's supposed to live in the in the bowel like what's it doing here and then you get the you know the reactions and the intolerances and and the allergies so um and we've also got huge evidence of that dysbiosis in the microbiome causing behavior issues, cognitive issues, learning problems. So when you <clears throat> when you have those dogs that you say, oh, he's untrainable or he's aggressive or um, he's scared all the time or overreactive to loud noises look at their gut because they probably have dysbiosis going on and they, they, like they're literally out of their mind because their their gut isn't right and look at their what they're eating most of them unfortunately are eating, are eating kibble that are filled mm -hmm. with preservatives and food dyes yeah. and all and of that's why things. the first thing on all the list the is that's species great. appropriate diet using whole foods <laughs> absolutely so how else can we naturally boost the dog's immune system besides you know species appropriate whole food first diet um you know minimal processing as possible well stop attacking it for one thing um <laughs> so we stop giving them synthetics stop giving them chemicals stop giving them so many vaccines or any vaccines if they've already had them once um I, if I have somebody that I'm really trying to boost, I will add colostrum. I don't add colostrum all the time, but if we're having a little struggle period, it can really help them. Um, it's just giving them a little boost. Um, vitamin D levels, really critical for the immune system to function well. Um, so there's a lot of micronutrients that we don't really think think about all the time that we need to make sure that we're getting in there. Um, and that's where, you know, if even if you're feeding a human grade whole food diet, if you've really strayed from where you need to be to have it even close to balanced, or you get really stuck in that rut of, oh, well, you know, I was, I was feeding him this balanced diet that had 20 ingredients. And now we're down to hamburger, rice and peas. Well, that, you know, it's just not going to work. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> So, you know, it, it happens with time. We all get a little bit lazy and it's like me. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. It's just, it's unfortunate, right? Because it is, but life happens on the system. Um, so, so this is just a little heads up. If you, if you were feeding like all these different things and, you know, getting the, the nice whole foods in my world, you have to col color the rainbow with your diet. So, um, if you've, if you've strayed away from that and you've gotten down to, uh, feeding the same thing every meal or gotten down to only having a few ingredients and you know, you're really far off from balance, um, take another look and start getting some other things on, onto that platter or into that bowl, however you're feeding them. <laughs> And there are a lot of whole food vitamins out there that have oh, yeah. synthetics in there. So you don't necessarily have to go buy the food. You can buy the supplements if you really want to be lazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, some, like I said, sometimes life, but even when, you know, even when I'm feeding my dogs, I feed raw and when I'm feeding them a commercial balanced diet, I'm still adding things. Like oh, there, are, there are certain things that I like, I need omega threes. I need extra omega threes because my dogs all have heart problems. I need um, deer antler velvet again, because they have heart problems. They have neurologic problems. Um, 
I'm trying to think what else I throw. There's a lot of stuff I throw in so their bowls. Therapeutic mushrooms are to me therapeutic it should, mushrooms. They should be on every dog's diet, right? Yes. Yep. So and we then, have mushrooms in there. I have bee pollen for my little guy who's yeah. got <laughs> all kinds of issues. <laughs> So my husband laughs at me because when I make my uh, Lola's food bowl in the morning, I put the bee pollen in her bowl and then I put some in my hand and I take it back. He's like, you're taking her <laughs> supplements. I'm like, well, technically she's taking mine. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, we share a lot. <laughs> yeah, We share so, a lot of our mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the therapeutic mushrooms, and I, I always say therapeutic because people think psilocybin. We're not talking about psilocybin, but mushrooms are a phenomenal immunomodulator. Um, and for those who don't know what that means, I'm hoping that you might be able to explain that a little bit to them. So remember when I talked about evening out the immune system and making it function the way that we want it to, not being overreactive, not being underreactive, that's kind of what the mushrooms do. And part of why the mushrooms work so well, besides they have all these wonderful chemicals in them that do really good things for our body, but they're also an incredible fiber source for the, so as a prebiotic for the good little army that we're trying to brew down below. Um, and that good little army really likes them. So and they're adaptogens. They, so it's an adaptogen herb too, or yep. plant. Or so they, they provide just so, and you know, we use different mushrooms for different things. Like I take lion's mane mushroom and that's what we give our little dog for brain and nerve health. Cause he's got hydrocephalus and I just have a brain that's a sieve. <laughs> <these days. laughs> um, so, you know, we use different, like reishi is the mushroom of immortality. We use turkey tail a lot for cancer problems. Um, so there's, you know, or you can just say, hey, I'm going to do a blend of five mushrooms, throw it all in there. It's fine. Um, I use shiitake mushrooms in so many of my recipes because I just, I think they're so amazing. They, they just do so many things for the body. So those are ways that we can... Um, you know, kind of even out the immune system. And, and because again, we're feeding the microbiome because that's something it really likes. Um, so it works from a lot of different angles. I love that. And I love mushrooms. I really think everyone <laughs> on this planet, humans, dogs, cats, everyone should be on mushrooms. I really truly do. Um, just don't go out and pick them on your own, right? So please don't take them. I wouldn't dare. Like, no. I've got <laughs> mushrooms popping up all over outside. I'm like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> I just saw some um my taki at the base of one of my trees. It's a little bit early, but Ooh. our weather's been kind of strange. So I will be harvesting that and Oh, that would be nice. So I want to dry it for soup. I'll end up eating it over the next two days and then I'll be That's looking so cool. for more. <laughs> that is very cool. No, we're just growing these humongous big white things. I don't know what they are, but they're oh. kind of coming up everywhere. So antioxidants, you know, talking again about whole food and uh, variety, right? Everything is kind of about diversity, as you were mentioning. And I'm a big fan of rotating um, different supplements in, you know, just to have that diversity. Um, can you explain a little bit more as to why that's important? And um, some other antioxidant sources that you might not have thought of that you give to your dogs on a regular basis. So oxidation is the process of, um, it's actually an inflammatory process. Um, so if you, the easiest way to kind of think about it, when you, you get a, a package of meat from the grocery store, like a package of hamburger, and it's kind of brown on the surface, and then you slice into the middle of it and it's that nice bright red. Well, the brown on the surface is oxidation. That's where it was exposed to air. It was exposed to oxygen and it just, it does that. So rust is on iron. That's a form of oxidation. So our cells are undergoing oxidation. Um, and the level of oxidation depends on a lot of things, you know, aging, uh, what toxins we put into our body, what food we put into our body. So there's a lot of different things that go into it. Um, so an antioxidant kind of is the anti-aging, um, trying to make your cells stay happier longer. Um, and our body, when we are young, so when the dogs are young, makes tons of antioxidants like CoQ10 as and vitamin d as we get older we don't do that so well so those levels will drop and for instance coq10 uh, you can also call it ubiquinol um so critical in so many functions Especially to keep heart health 
yeah, heart, but to keep cells in general alive, like the mitochondria need it. Um, so when the those levels are dropping, particularly in our older animals or animals who are sick, animals with cancer, um, vitamin D falls in this category as well. As animals age, even if you are feeding a diet that is complete and balanced on paper, that doesn't necessarily mean that your pet will absorb it as well or utilize it as well. So it's amazing. Um, um, one of my best uh, examples of this, I have a client who was making my pup loaf and then also feeding a commercial brand of raw that I highly recommend. And so both diets complete and balanced. And she had a young dog and an old dog. She had vitamin D levels tested. Normal for that lab was 100 to 150. The young dog came out at about 86 and the old dog came back like 42 and she said oh my gosh like i'm i thought i was feeding complete and balanced diet i'm like you are that's just what your dogs are able to utilize or not utilize and it also depends how long the product was frozen you know how long it sat was it made six months ago was it made yesterday because the fat soluble vitamins will degrade but it's really how the body is able to utilize it so um I've got a great blog on vitamin D on my website and all the different things that go wrong when you are low in vitamin D. Things like cancer, um, <clears throat> inability to digest your food well. I mean, just it's so important for so many things. So I strongly recommend that everybody test at least once a year, but really twice a year for vitamin D levels, particularly in their senior dogs because it's critical. Um, and then CoQ10, frankly, if you have a dog that's a breed prone to heart disease, go ahead and start them by four or five years of age. And if you have one that has heart disease, up your levels. I give five to 10 milligrams per pound of body weight twice a day, uh, which is way above yeah. what it's labeled for, but that's where we need it to be. There's great studies. That, uh, a second one just came out. That most of them are being done in um, the Far East, interestingly, like Singapore. Um, but uh, these studies are showing that we could actually shrink heart size in these animals who are going into heart failure just with the addition of CoQ10 at these high levels. So um, that's how critical the antioxidants are. And there's a lot of different things that you can use for antioxidants. Uh, fish, very high antioxidant levels. Fish oils, if you have a, a good one, uh, make sure it's not rancid. Um, egg yolks, high antioxidant level. Um, some of the... Um, orange and yellow veggies uh red veggies very very good antioxidants fruits love, like blueberries I love spirulina spirulina is great spirulina. so um you know whether you're using a um you know a dried powder product or a fresh uh product but those are the so this is why even though my dogs are fed really high quality raw diets made by companies that i adore <clears throat> i'm still throwing things in there yeah. Um, because I want to, to add that extra antioxidant. I, um, I will throw like fermented things in there. As a matter of fact, I just made a bunch of frozen treats and it's got a product in it. It has bone marrow or bone broth in it. Uh, some coconut chips that I, I throw it all in the Nutribullet, um, bone, bone broth, coconut chips, um, a fermented green product. Am I allowed to say names here? Uh, it was a, it was a green juju product. Um, I love them. And then Actually, some, I'm really excited about their new beet and uh, uh, golden paste. I I've been using those this week. So my dogs have the little blob of green, the little blob yep. of orange, and the little blob <laughs> of red on the corners of their plates. It's so much fun. Um, but I threw all this, and then I had some cut up fruit in the fridge, which was um, cantaloupe, strawberry, banana, and blueberry. And so I threw all this into my little Nutribullet and then put it in my little molds and threw it in the freezer. The dogs love this. So, awesome. you know, I just, I just love going to my cabinet where all my dog stuff is and just pulling out different things and then going in the pantry or the refrigerator and going, this would be good for them. And then, <laughs> you know, I just, I just start experimenting and throwing things together. And um, if I run out of their little frozen treats at night, they're really mad. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned uh fermented products and it, so this will be one of the last questions because uh, i know i've taken a lot of your time and i really appreciate it in supporting the microbiome right adding in fermented products really does provide such a variety of bacteria strains that helps to diversify the different colonies and um yeah just speak to that because not all fermented foods for instance right 
beer and wine yep. fermented, but <laughs> they don't provide <laughs> probiotics, right? And they're toxic to our dogs. But let's think about some other fermented products that can be helpful. And would you stay away from soy-based fermented products because of the potential for it to be an endocrine disruptor? Yeah, I'm not a fan of soy for animals, period. Um <clears throat> So, there, I mean, there's, <laughs> I just had Billy Hookman at my house for the, for the weekend. So the king of fermentation. Um, <laughs> so he ferments everything. everything. Uh, you'll, if you get to talk to him, ask, ask him about his poop cheese. That was not a good fermentation. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, so whether you're fermenting whole raw milks, like whole goat milk or whole cow's milk, and it's easy to do. I mean, literally, if you have a probiotic, the raw in the raw milk and sit on your counter for 24 hours, you now have a fermented product. Um, you can ferment veggies. It can sometimes be a little trickier, but I mean, people have been making kimchi for, for ages. So there's just so many different ways that you can do it, you know, um, get some, uh, some, uh, active apple cider vinegar like the bragg's apple cider vinegar that's got a, a mother in it that'll in it, yep. um, start to ferment things so um but the fermented foods what we're doing is we're adding a natural source of billions if not trillions of good guys um so you don't need a lot like a little bit will go a long way at inoculating the gut and helping repopulate it with what we want it to have and um frankly we are not capable of measuring all the different species of bacteria that and virus and fungi that live in our gut and in our lungs and on our skin well and it um, changes right it changes from day to day second to second it does and uh every time you change the diet so for for humans we eat something different every meal um as most of us do, uh, for our dogs, they should be eating different things too. And the microbiome will change. And um, the gut is very adaptive and it will do that with no problem. And I, this is where I, I get really angry with the put the same thing in the bowl every day, never vary. Um, like the, the nutritionists who formulate diets for people with dogs with you know, IBS or kidney disease or whatever their problem is. And they're like, here's your protein, here's your carb, here's your veggie, here's your synthetic vitamin. Don't vary from that. Don't ever put anything else in the bowl. That is a bunch of crap. Like they're not going to be healthy with that. The, there's just so many problems with that. Um, but we also have to consider that on the skin. So how often are we bathing with products that are killing the skin microbiome? How often are we destroying the skin microbiome? Um, and, you know, that's kind of our first line of defense. It kind of covers most of our body. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and technically, if you are feeding a dog appropriately, they really, they're not going to stink. You're not going to need to give them baths. I might give my dogs a bath once a year. And that's just because they might have rolled in poop, you know? <laughs> and I don't I have to do my house. boys who pee on their feathers. <laughs> <laughs> their aim is not good. <laughs> I really appreciate all of your time and all of your uh, knowledge and being able to share that with us. If people want to learn more, how can they find you? DrJudyMorgan.com. Really simple. <laughs> yeah, super simple. I really appreciate your time again. It's always a pleasure um, talking with you and, and learning from you. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. All right. Take care.